Geek Therapy Radio. Welcome to the Geek Therapy Radio broadcast. I'm your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger, broadcasting live recorded, recorded live at the Geek Therapy Studios here at the Hamburger household in Missouri City, Texas. That is where the man cave resides, and that's where I'm right where I'm at right now. It's kind of a it's not too hot outside, but this this section of the house, I almost said wing of the house, as if I have a wing to my mansion here. Now, this part of the house is a little bit hot, and uh, I'll just muscle through it. I'm going to sit here and sweat and stick to my leather chair, but we'll get through it. So, something that occurred to me, a little thought that I had in my mind during current times, is often people draw comparisons between uh, coronavirus and the Spanish flu back in 1918. 1918 is also uh, the last time the Red Sox won the World Series before 2004 and 2000. Seven and nine and thirteen and whatever they they've won several since then, but nineteen eighteen also was World War One, Spanish flu killed six hundred and what was it six hundred and seventy five thousand people in in the United States, and about fifty million people worldwide. What does this say? The Spanish flu. So back in nineteen eighteen, I'm reading from a website here, medical. What is it? Medicalnewstoday.com. I'm going to read this little blurb here. From January 1918 to December 1920, the virus, which is exactly 100 years ago, the virus, which appears to have moved from birds to humans, infected an estimated 500 million people. This equates to one in three people on Earth at the time. The virus killed around 675,000 people in the United States alone and approximately 50 million people worldwide. So 675,000 people here in the U.S. What was the population here in 1918? And to the Google we go. U.S. population in 1918 was 103,208,000. In 1918. More than half a million people, 675,000 people. That's a significant chunk of the population of the United States in 1918 when the Spanish flu ravaged the country. The only reason I'm bringing this up is, like I mentioned a few seconds ago, I've heard several people mention the Spanish flu, both in severity and how the United States handled it, and blah 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 And it just kind of occurred to me, there are not many people alive on Earth that are old enough to remember the Spanish flu. You would have to, it's not only would the person have to be 100 years old, if they were 100 years old in in 2020, that would mean they were born in 1920 towards the end of the Spanish flu. So they would have to be born at an age old enough to remember the Spanish flu, which means they'd probably have to be born at the earliest. The the flu happened in, in 1918 means they would have to be probably born around 1912, I would say, around the time that the Titanic sank. And there aren't that many people around. And why I'm mentioning this is we don't have any living experts that have been through the Spanish flu to draw any sort of conclusions. And it was an interesting concept to think about now is our generation is going through this. There have been pandemics before the coronavirus, pandemics in between the Spanish flu and the coronavirus, so we've had SARS, and you can count HIV, uh, HIV as one of them, AIDS, technically started by a virus, but it's not, it's not the same as coronavirus. It doesn't act the same as a, as a traditional, you know, something like coronavirus. But there have been, we haven't had anything on the scale of coronavirus, and poss- at least in the United States and worldwide even, since 1918. There are, yes, you can make arguments about Ebola, and that didn't really affect the United States so much, and I can only speak personally from somebody who lives in the United States that, yes, Ebola ravaged Africa and other parts of the world, so did other viruses, but speaking to Americans right now, there's nobody alive, nobody alive right now that can tell us how it was going through the Spanish flu a hundred years ago, and why that's interesting to me is that also means that... We likely will be the 
last generation for a hundred, another hundred years that experiences a pandemic on the scale of coronavirus, which makes me wonder in a hundred years from now, whenever the next global pandemic on the scale of the coronavirus sweeps across the globe, will they forget whatever we've learned during the coronavirus in 2020? In the year 2120, when they're dealing with another pandemic, I mean, God forbid, hopefully by then we'd have figured out how to stamp these things out medically with or without a vaccine. But you get what I'm saying here. It, it's not like somebody in 100 years from now can ask, can look around to somebody who's 105 years old. Let's say somebody starts forming real lasting memories at between the age of three and five who could remember the pandemic. There certainly wouldn't be anybody old enough in the year 2120 who could who could really conceptualize and articulate what it was to go through coronavirus 100 years old, 100 years earlier in 2020. And it just makes you think. You you would think right now in the year 2020 that we would have, that we would uh, capture all the information, hold on to all the information reliably to last 100 years, to hopefully guide somebody in the year 2020, a population in the year 20, sorry, 2120, with enough information still around, still encapsulated for all time to glean information from 100 years previous. Because I don't think we've been able to glean it in a whole lot of information from 1918 and 1920 in in regards to coronavirus bookkeeping just wasn't what it what it is in 2020 records can be destroyed all we know is the amount of deaths and yes there is information there but certainly the technology the medical technology didn't exist 100 years ago like it exists today so we don't have that kind of data to work with so what kind of data would somebody in 2120 have to work with Dealing in regards to the coronavirus of 2020, what kind of information could they learn from in 2120? Would we still have the anti-vaxxers and anti-maskers like we have in 2020 in the year 2120? One would certainly hope not. Maybe in the beginning of the next segment, I might talk a little bit about the tyranny aspect of wearing masks god forbid we have to wear masks i might speak on that a little bit in the next segment but there is some actual geek news coming up i thought it's pretty geeky to kind of wonder and, and think about history and and where we're going from here and in terms of the spanish flu coronavirus and what's going to happen 100 years from now what can we learn from past generations it's kind of fun to think about it's a little bit of geek therapy to think about that i'm also going to talk a little bit about playstation and pricing uh, but we'll get to that in the next segment stick around more geek therapy radio coming up i'm your mental curator Johnny Hamburger. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the Geek Therapy Radio broadcast here recorded live at the Geek Therapy Radio studios in Missouri City, Texas. My man cave in the hot wing of the house. Mmm, hot wings. Anyway, so in the previous segment, we were talking about coronavirus and the Spanish flu and that there's not really anybody alive today who remembers vividly enough about the Spanish flu to give us some sort of help and guidance in dealing with the coronavirus. Granted, they were two completely separate ordeals. Population sizes were different. But as I mentioned in the last uh, segment, one in three people in the entire world were affected by the Spanish flu, and we had 675,000 deaths in the United States out of a population of about 103 million. The population of the United States over the past 100 years or so has more than tripled. We are about, we're, we're, we're around 340 million people here in the United States right now as of 2020. And I would wager, so... Yeah, we won't talk about the current deaths. We're not going to get too morbid with it. We're we're around 200,000 deaths as of recording right now in the United States alone. Anyways, I was going to speak to the point of masks, and I call them anti-maskers, anti-vaxxers. It's it's kind of a funny concept to think of right right now. Anti-vaxxers, and I'm not, I don't mean to, I'm not trying to be mean to you, I think... It's 100% cuckoo. That's just my personal opinion. I think medically it's not based in much science to be an anti-vaxxer, but that's just me. I'm not hearing a lot from anti-vaxxers right now during the pandemic, though. I don't see many anti-vaxxers raising their hand 
to uh, get coronavirus. And I wonder how anti-vaxxers think right now, if there's any reformed anti-vaxxers who know people who've had COVID-19 who might raise their hand, yeah, um, eventually when a vaccine comes out for the coronavirus, if it ever does, will those same anti-vaxxers who are anti-vaccination say, yeah, the coronavirus kind of sucks. Um, I think in this one case, I will take a vaccination just for coronavirus since we've been able to see what it does firsthand for so long. Just... Just something to speculate there. The other day, I mentioned on Facebook, just my personal Facebook, I didn't say this on Geek Therapy Radio's Facebook, wink, wink, there's a plug, go follow Geek Therapy Radio on Facebook if you so desire. I made the illusion, the little anecdote, that if the population from 2020 was transported to 1942, I'm talking about the United States population. If the U.S. population of 2020 was magically transported to 1942 and Uncle Sam was asking us to take one for the team to support the war effort, I said that by 1945, we'd have all been speaking German. Somehow, since the 40s and since World War II, Americans enough Americans, and I'm not talking to everybody right now, maybe you listening, you you're, are less self-absorbed than others, but somewhere along the line, we went from doing our part to support our country, you know, what can we do for our country, it's not what our country can do for us, it's what we can do for our country, at some point we went from that ethic to what can we do to help out our own neighbor, to completely complete self-absorption. So in 1942, during the height of World War II, when Uncle Sam, the U.S. government, was saying, hey, stuff, it's hard right now. We're going to have just ration medals, ration meals, do what you can to take one for the team, to support our boys across the pond, to support the United States as a whole in this effort during these trying times, during this world war. It's very tough right now. If we all just did our part just for a little while, just for a few years until we see this through, we'll get through it. And the greatest generation did exactly that. And that is why we are not speaking German right now. Fast forward to 2020, the population of 2020. Hey, it sucks right now. We're going through a global pandemic. Uh, Cases of COVID are spiking. Can we all just, when you're out of your house, when you're in your house, do whatever you want. But when you're out of your house and you're going to Walmart or you're going to the grocery store, can you just wear a mask? Please just wear a mask. And even when they enforce these mandates that, hey, you should wear a mask out in public. I haven't seen anybody arrested for it. Just people kicked out of businesses. I'll touch on that in a second here. That Uncle Sam is asking us now, and we have, we're have we very disenchanted with Uncle Sam. I, I won't play that part down a little bit. We are, inc- we are more suspicious of our government now, I think, in 2020 than we were back in the 1940s. I'll give you that. But the fact remains that Americans are being asked, and again, I can only speak for Americans because I'm an American in America, in Texas, one of the hotbeds for spiking COVID cases right now. The government is asking the people, it sucks right now. Can we all just take one for the team in the form of wearing a mask? It's not even taking a big one for a team. It's just wearing a mask while you go out to pub- go out in public. That's it. That's all we're asking. On your own private property, you don't have to wear a mask. You can do whatever you want. You can cough in your own family members' faces at home. Do whatever you want. But if you're going out to the grocery store, can you please just put on a mask? For now. Right now. It sucks. I kind of equate it to taking broccoli, eating broccoli, asking a five-year-old to eat their broccoli before they have dessert. We're The government right now is asking the population, can you just eat some broccoli so we can get to dessert faster? And there are certain contingency, there, well, there's certain parts of the population that take that as a form of tyranny. That just looking out for your neighbor, being asked, and in some cases enforced, to look out for your neighbor is taken as a form of tyranny. It doesn't make sense. Now, to that point, this is just my opinion, send hate mail to geektherapy at iheartmedia.com or the Geek Therapy Radio Facebook page or Twitter or Instagram. Send all the hate mail there. You can find me. Let's talk about tyranny for a second. We see all sorts of videos on social media, video clips, 
of people being kicked out of stores. Let's just use Walmart, for example. People being kicked out of Walmart because they refuse to wear a mask in Walmart. And these people are claiming it's tyranny and it goes against their rights as an American and blah 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 It's bullcrap. It's ignorant. It's uneducated. I'm not saying that the people are stupid, but they're ignorant. Here's why. Walmart is private property just like your house. Walmart can say what can and can't come into their own private property. They make the rules for their own private property. So if Walmart in this case says nobody is allowed in unless you're wearing a mask and unless you social distance and unless you wash your hands, Walmart can do that because they are private property. It's exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing as asking your neighbor not to come into your living room and take a dump on the carpet. It's your house, your rules. You get to say who does or doesn't come into your house on your own private property. In Texas, you can even shoot someone in the face if they come in uninvited. You can do that. It will ruin your life. Let's not, to all the Rambos out there who say they're just going to shoot anybody who steps on their property, it will ruin your life financially. You can't just kill somebody, even in the state of Texas, and walk away from it scot-free without it ruining your life for years. Let's just get that thing straight. But the fact remains is, it is your private property. You can tell people, hey, don't come in my house unless you take your shoes off, because it's your private property. Walmart, Walgreens, CVS, restaurants, they can all say, hey, you can't come in here unless you're wearing a mask, because it's their private property. It's funny where we as Americans draw the line as to what we perceive of what is or is not tyranny. And apparently, having a private owner of property, Walmart, say, hey, you can't come in here without a mask, all of a sudden that's tyranny? Doesn't make any sense. Just let's think of this with rational brains here. That aspect doesn't make sense. When you have government officials saying cases are going up, We're issuing a mandate right now. Wear masks. That's tyranny. Government telling us what to do. My gosh. Goes back to 1940s. Uncle Sam saying, it sucks right now. For a little while, can we just wear some masks? Can we just ration a little bit? Can we see what we can do for our country and our countrymen rather than... just continuously asking what can the government give us and it's kind of funny that the same people who are claiming this is tyranny also complain about government handouts it's kind of a funny concept sorry to get so spicy here in the broadcast but it's interesting concept to think about it's ignorance is what it is but let's get to a lighter subject more geek therapy coming up Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Unless it's wearing a mask, F that. Welcome back to Geek Therapy Radio, I'm your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. Sorry things have been getting a little spicy right now. But pick your battles. We have had it so good for the past hundred years in the United States, well not a hundred years, we've had it so good. Well, certain people in the United States have had it so good since World War II that we have completely forgotten, a lot of us, a lot of us right now, have completely forgotten what it means to do what you can for your country versus asking what your country can do for you. And it's just funny that masks is it for a lot of people that the line in the sand (laughs) your country's asking you to do too much by strapping some cloth to your face occasionally when you're out in public that's oh that's crossing the line that's tyranny my goodness gracious pick your battles let's pick our freaking battles 2020 is going to be distant memory for a lot of us sooner than later. I myself am about to be 37 years old this summer. I'm 36 years old right now. I'm going to look back 40 years from now, old, thinking back to 2020 and thinking, well, that was a, that was a tough, boy, what a tough time that was. And not just because of coronavirus, but because of civil uprising and hopefully things have, have been gotten way better over the next 
four decades. Hopefully things ease and everybody is truly treated equal by that time. Everybody has equal opportunity, truly. Truly. Come on, look deep inside your soul if you have such a, a hard time with what I just said right there. Look deep inside your soul. You know what I'm talking about. Truly have equal opportunity. Truly are looked upon without bias based on differences that are skin deep. Maybe we'll get better. I have. Maybe we'll be closer to the Star Trek vision of the future. You know, it, it, perhaps that's wishful thinking. There are people that are going to live and die and go to their grave without ever adhering to that. And you know what? It's not fine, but history will move on. We will move forward. It's just hopefully things will get better from here. I've always thought of racism. Let's just not beat around the bush. And sexism. I've always thought of racism and sexism as in the United States, at least, as far as is concerned, let's not pretend that racism doesn't exist elsewhere. You can, oh man, the most redneck of us, if you went to Europe, Northern Europe, you would blush at the racism that exists there. You would blush at how white Europeans talk about other races. We, the United States does not have a patent on racism. We're not even the kings of racism. We're not even doing racism the best. Arguably, I think we are doing racism better than anywhere else in the world, and I'll touch on that in a segment. But ask a European how they, uh, what they think about Arabs, gypsies, Roma, black people. Ask a Northern European. Ask the most well-to-do, woke European what they think about minorities. And not everybody, I don't mean to alienate people here, not everybody, but you would be surprised at what you hear at a bar in Northern Europe coming out of a woke white person's mouth. It will absolutely make the reddest redneck blush. And I don't mean to say redneck as if all rednecks are racist. That's just completely not true. Rednecks, oh man, rednecks can party. Rednecks are some of the best people that I've ever met in my life. And rednecks just means that you're outside working, that you work with your hands, that you know what it is to put in a hard day's work. But there is a negative terror stereotype to the term redneck that makes people think of racist. It's not true. It's stereotypical. But what other stereotypes can we have? Oh, what about black people? What stereotypes do you have in your mind about black people if you are racist? Isn't stereotyping stupid? Doesn't it not make any sense at all? That's the only point I'm making here. It doesn't make any sense to be racist. It makes no logical sense. So racism and sexism, I always thought, as, back to the, you know, bringing it back home to the United States here, I always thought it was willfully tying one arm and a leg behind our back. Basically, when you've excluded other races and you exclude other genders that we're not doing ourselves as a society any favor we're, we're trying to, to to plow this field with one arm and one leg because we won't allow the other arm and other leg to participate it's really it's silly the way that works and it, it's it's amazing how far we've gotten with one arm and one leg tied behind our back it really is and things have gotten better over the past few decades i will acknowledge that of course especially on the sexism front and opportunities for women. It's not perfect. It's not perfect for other races either. It's not perfect. But it's getting there and it's growing pains. The United States, you have to remember, the United States is a young country. Look at the history and how long other countries around the world have existed. They've existed for over a thousand years. A lot of them over a thousand years, thousands of years, some of them. United States is what? Almost 300 years old at this point? Around 300 years old? That's nothing on the scale. We are still a, very much an experiment. This, this American experiment is in full fling here. So before I was mentioning that the most racist white person in the United States would blush if they went to Northern Europe, the reason why you hear a lot of Europeans say that they don't have a problem with racism is that the races know their place. 
they have been set in place for thousands of years in those countries. So it's not that there's no problem with racism. It's just the issue never comes up. That's what they mean by we don't have a problem with racism. It's because the issue never comes up. Well, not never, but more rarely than it does in the United States, for sure. I was talking to a black Dutchman, and there's many more that would that would repeat this sentiment that if you are black in the Netherlands... You, just, you were raised by your own black parents to accept your, your, your slot in society, to accept your class in society, just to know that you are probably never going to get a promotion, you are never going to reach past this glass ceiling, because it's just set. Society is so set now that you can't make it, so don't stir the pot. Just do the best you can and don't stir the pot. Then you don't, quote-unquote, have a problem with racism. It just means that it doesn't come up the same way that it does in the United States. When the rest of the countries look on the United States, I can't help but think they see black people, in this instance, fighting for their rights to exist and have equal opportunity and look down on us because we have a problem, quote-unquote, with racism, which we do. But the difference in the United States is that they can fight for their friggin' rights, that they have the freedom to do so. Even when it hurts, even when it's ugly, even when it makes us feel bad, even when it means bloodshed and tears and sweat and screams and yelling, they have the right to do that here. Racism has the right here in the United States to bubble up and be uncomfortable. We are all equal in the eyes of our creator. That's part of civil rights and human rights and American rights. That means you have the right to raise your voice, even if it's uncomfortable and lash out and fight for your right to exist. We have that here. It's open. It's, it's kind of, it's expected that if you are downtrodden, it's the same reason, it's the same reason while, while in the beginning of the show, I was talking about anti-maskers and anti-vaxxers, they have the right, and God bless them, they have the right to think that way. They have the right to voice their opposition to Hidalgo or whoever in government saying, we're going to mandate masks now. You have the right as an American to speak out against it. You have that right. Minorities in this country have the right and are almost expected to, and it's a beautiful thing when they fight for that right. It's painful, but it's a beautiful thing that we all have that right. White Americans, Black Americans, Asian Americans, Latino Americans, every single American here has the right to go out in the street and fight for their rights. They have that right. And they are raised with that fight in them. They are not raised by their own parents of minority to squash that fire. To put a bushel over that fire. So you just accept just accept your lot in life. Make it easier on yourself. Just, ex, just accept that you're always going to be second class. We don't have that here. There, there is not... I don't imagine there's many minority parents in the in, in the United States raising their kids to believe that they should accept their lot in life. That is so anti-American to just accept that your life is going to be crap and raise that way. Just expect it. Just accept that your life is crap and let's move on. Accept that your life is crap so we don't have a racism problem. We are getting feisty here on Geek Therapy Radio today. I promise the last segment coming up here is going to be more geeky, but I can't be quiet about this stuff, and it's just my opinion. And one more time, send your hate mail, geektherapy at iheartmedia.com or Geek Therapy Radio on Facebook, Geek Therapy Radio on Twitter. You disagree with anything I'm saying, go for it. I triple dog dare you. (laughs) Uh, I love you guys for listening. More Geek Therapy Radio coming up. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Geek Therapy Radio. I'm your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. Let's talk about PlayStation 5 pricing for a moment. I'm just reading here now that a few episodes of Geek Therapy Radio ago, we were speculating on the price based on a leak by the French Amazon website that 
for a moment. Uh, it appeared that the PlayStation 5 made it to Amazon France, and the prices would have equ- equated to about between 450 550 US dollars doing the conversion from euros and speculating on the price in British pounds and whatnot. Turns out that French leak was fake. That was fake. That said, there's another leak. Anytime we talk, we speculate on price based on leaks, it goes without saying that it should be taking, taken with a pinch of salt. I don't want to talk the entire segment about pricing here, but it is well known here in Geek Therapy Radio that my my best estimate falls in between $450 to possibly $550, and the lower end of that bell curve towards the right, like the highest price possible, I think, would be around $600. I went into many reasons, not the least of which is that the, the PlayStation 5 is going to come out during a recession after coronavirus when a lot of people have lost their jobs this isn't going to be the same type of holiday shopping season that that we know typically so sony is going to have to price a new console release appropriately to try to entice buyers that's why i don't think it's going to come out at six hundred dollars for the blu-ray edition five hundred dollars for the digital edition i think it's going to be more along the lines of five hundred dollars for the blu-ray edition and four hundred dollars for the digital edition that's just my personal thoughts my personal estimate but it's fun to speculate it's fun to speculate that's why i said you take all these with a grain of salt because all we're doing right now is speculating sony has not come out yet with official prices for the playstation 5 the latest leaks that have been released as of now and we we can't tell that if this is fake or not all we have to go on right now is that it's our our best guesstimate leak right now is from japan that the japan launch is slated to be november 14th with a global launch november 20th that's not in stone this is speculation this is leaks that in japan the playstation 5 blu-ray console which is the most expensive version is going to release for 49,980 yen or that equates to about 499 euros 449 uh, British pounds or $499 US. $499 US for the PS5 Blu-ray console. The digital edition US speculation on this leak is $399. UK $349. EU $399. Japan uh, $44,980 yen. That's all the speculation based on the leak. My point in going over this right now is that all the leaks so far, no matter what source they come from, no matter how validated or invalidated they are, it's still within that price sphere, within those parentheses of price. At the lowest end, about 450 US dollars. At the highest end, about 550 dollars. I think it's going to be in between that 400 dollars and 600 dollars. Every leak we've seen so far, substantiated, unsubstantiated speculation, it all comes down to that. And I still hold firm that that's the price, that's the price point that I, that I think it's going to come in at for the uh, PlayStation 5. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention here, I was talking to my wife about this the other night, that I came across this term in the uh, Urban Dictionary. Urban Dictionary is fun just to look through. Uh, but this term, doom scrolling. Doom scrolling means that you spend a lot of time on social media basically looking for doom and gloom, trying to validate and trying to make sense of your world by scrolling through social by scrolling through Facebook, scrolling through Twitter and just seeing all the nonsense and all the hatred and and all the misinformation and real information, but it's feeding into this deep-seated fear that we all have and that it's not Men- it's not healthy. It's not good for your mental health. I don't think anybody would challenge that, that it's not good to your ment- for your mental health. One interesting aspect of this, though, why in 2020, with all that's going on, coronavirus, civil unrest, that doom scrolling is as bad as ever, is that we don't have sports right now. And I know some people listening, 
some geeks among us aren't geeks about sports. We're not geeks about baseball, geeks about football, geeks about basketball. I personally love baseball. Baseball is my sport of choice. I played varsity baseball. I played baseball for 18, 20 years. It's my sport. Varsity. I made starting varsity. I love baseball. But we don't have baseball right now. Baseball is planned to come back for a 60-game season soon, so any baseball fans out there, rejoice in that. It's going to be very different, very weird. The dugouts are going to be different. There's going to be social distancing. We'll see how it works out with the masks and all sorts of stuff. But uh, Major League Baseball has announced they would like to start an abbreviated season, at least. As we all know, NASCAR has already started. Nobody's in the crowd. But the point is, for the better half of the year, of 2020, we've not had any sports. That is to say, we've not had any distraction. So the time we would have spent scrolling around social media and talking on social media would have been as armchair athletes. We'd be talking about the last football game. We'd be talking about the last Red Sox game, the last Astros game. We'd be talking about the last Rockets game or the last Spurs game. But we don't have that now. All we have right now to scroll through is doom and gloom. And that's all we have to talk about right now is the doom and gloom. As far as the bulk of social media is concerned. So now is the worst time in the history of social media, I'll just say. It's the worst time in the history of social media to sit there for hours a day, thumbing up and down through your social feed. All it's going to do is make you sad and paranoid and angry and fearful. Doesn't make sense. That's why Geek Therapy Radio, I've always implored you, turn off the social media once in a while. You don't have to quit the social media. I obviously can't make you do anything, and I'm not asking you to quit the social media. But if you find that you're spending a couple hours a day scrolling through Facebook or Twitter, try at least to remember a hobby that you used to like, or a hobby that you'd like to get into. Maybe you like working outside. Maybe, you know, trim, trim, your, trim your damn lawn. <laughs> Get away from the social media for a minute and trim your yard. Edge your lawn. Get the HOA off your back, whatever. For a lot of people, that is great geek therapy, getting out there and working on the yard, mowing the lawn, putting on those noise-canceling headphones and just rocking out for a couple hours. That is an awesome form of geek therapy. Maybe you have a record collection collecting dust or a turntable. Get that thing working again. Look up the model. If it doesn't, if your turntable doesn't work for some reason, look up the model of your turntable, a Sony whatever, and then just type into eBay, Sony whatever model number belt, and put a new belt on there. Because I guarantee you, if it's belt driven, it's just the belt that has rotted off <laughs> over the last couple of decades. Get back into records and the joy of playing records, cassette tapes, any number of things that you can tinker with, any hobbies that you used to have but that you think you don't have time for, but it really it's amounted to social media taking up all that time, get back into it. You've been meaning to change the spark plug on your classic car for years. Change the spark plugs on your old Mustang, on your old Camaro, on your old whatever, on your first generation Miata MX-5. Stop with the doom scrolling. I think we can all take that lesson. I think we all, to some degree, some of us more than others, can just realize how much time we're spending feeding our fear and anger and hatred and entrenchment and what good we can do for ourselves to get away from that. Just try to rekindle an old hobby or find a new one. Geek Therapy Radio podcast is always available. I talk about a lot of stuff right there. So if you want to go to geektherapyradio.com and, and search through all the old podcasts, I meticulously label all them. Maybe you'll find something in the archives there that'll spark an interest in a, in, in a hobby, something to, to maybe pick up, and you'll find that you're actually good at something and you enjoy doing something more than just scrolling through Facebook. Anyways, that's going to do it for Geek Therapy Radio. Uh, thank you for listening. Once again, the Geek Therapy Radio podcast is available on the iHeartRadio app or your favorite podcast player. Go to geektherapyradio.com for merch and contact information. Contact is right there on the first page you see. It's really easy to get in touch with me. Visit my friends at Best Automotive in Kingwood on North Park. They'll take care of your classic car or your modern car. And above all else, know that you are loved. You are, you are worthy of both giving and receiving love, and you're worthy of your own self-respect. Take care. Be safe. I'll talk to you next time.